When God said, just look at the serpent, what he was really saying is, you'll be saved by faith. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to crawl there. You don't have to do anything. You just have to look. And Jesus is actually saying, see, I save you not by anything you do, but just looking at me in faith. Hi, we're doing a series on discovering the gospel in every single book of the Bible. And uh, you really can't understand what's in a particular book. And I hope that uh, as Christians, we are reading the Bible regularly through every year or two. But you can't always understand what's in the Bible, a book, a book, particular book, unless you understand what the book is about and how it fits into the whole Bible. So each time we're going to be briefly looking at what is this book about? How does it actually move the storyline of the Bible forward? How does it show us something about the gospel of grace? And how does it actually show us and point to Jesus himself? So let's get started on the book of Numbers. Uh, what is the book of Numbers about? Numbers actually happens between Exodus and Leviticus, where uh, God has brought the people of Israel out of slavery and taken them to Mount Sinai and given them the law and given them the tabernacle. And it happens between that and Deuteronomy and Joshua, where they get to the promised land and go in. So the book of Numbers is actually just about the wandering in the wilderness that period of time. And it is roughly divided between two parts. Chapters 1 to 26 is about the dying off of the first generation of Israelites. And then uh, chapters 27 to 36 to the end is about the maturing of the second generation who's actually going to go in. Uh, the pivotal section in the book of Numbers is in uh, basically chapters 13, 14, where uh, they get to the promised land and the first generation says, we're not going to risk our lives to go in there. And they just don't believe God. And then God says, OK, then you're going to die in the wilderness and your children will go in. And so that's really what the book of Numbers is about, about the wandering in the wilderness. And the themes of the book of Numbers are uh, extremely helpful for a Christian because Numbers happens between the deliverance from Egypt and the coming into the promised land. Uh, numbers happens when believers have been saved, but they're not fully yet into the promised land. And that's actually where all Christians are. We are, we've been saved by Jesus Christ on the cross, but we are still have not gotten to heaven. We have not gotten to the new heavens and new earth. And right now we're in a wilderness situation. The book of Hebrews actually says so. We are like the children of Israel in numbers. We are relying on God, on the, uh, the spirit to guide us, on the word to guide us, on the forgiveness of sins through uh, sacrifice, blood sacrifice. We are relying on that to get us through the wilderness, but the wilderness is a time of testing, a time when our faith is tested, a time when we have a lot of promises that have been fulfilled. So the book of Numbers is very relevant to Christians uh, because we are also in this between time, between the first and second coming of Christ. But how does this actually fit into the whole uh, Bible as a, as a story? And Numbers, along with, as we will see, uh, some of the other books like uh, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, uh, are, it's driven, the plot is driven by the promise in Ab to Abraham in Genesis 5, uh, 12. Genesis 12, Abraham is given three promises. Your people are going to, your, your family will become a great nation, they will have this land, and then they will be a, a blessing to the nations. Well, now in Exodus, we actually see that God has made uh, the children of Israel are a great nation. But the unfulfilled part of the promise is, will they ever get into the land? And if they do get into the land, will they live in such a way that they're a witness to the nations? And the book of Numbers, frankly, um, is a, a scary book. Because if you know the promise in Genesis 12, you know that what Numbers is about is, will this happen? Will they actually get there? Will they be a witness to the nations and get into the land? And the, the what really happens here is you begin to wonder because they're back and forth. Uh, the first part of Numbers is pretty 
bleak. The second part of Numbers is a little bit more hopeful. But Numbers is filled with questions about, will they ever make it? And that's how it moves the plot along. How does it speak to the gospel of grace? And the gospel of grace is, what is the gospel of grace? It's that we're saved by Christ, not by our own good works. We're saved by grace, not by a changed life. And yet, saving grace always changes the life. Can I say that again? We're saved by Christ's work, not our work. So we're saved by grace, not a changed life. But the grace always changes the life. How does Numbers point to that? It points to it a couple ways. One is if you look at Numbers 1 to 10, it talks a great deal about the fact that though God has called the children of Israel to obey his law, that they'll never do it. (laughs) <laughs> they will never do it. They're going to be constantly needing sacrifices, blood sacrifices in the tabernacle uh, in order to atone for their sins. So right off the bat, the book of uh, Numbers is talking about the fact that you're, we're not going to be, you're not going to be saved. You're not going to get into the promised land by your good works. You're going to get into the promised land only through uh, the grace of God and the atoning work of, of God. A second thing you find in the book of Numbers is that God very often turns curses into blessings. Like Balaam, this very, the story of Balaam is fascinating. Balaam seems to be this occult figure. And uh, a pagan king tries to get Balaam to curse the Jews, to weaken them. But in the end, it all turns into a blessing for the Jews. And that's a foretaste of the fact that God is going to eventually bring the great blessing, which is salvation through Jesus Christ taking the curse. But here's the way in which he actually, the book of Numbers actually points to Jesus. Through the book of Numbers, you see Moses constantly having to intercede for the children of Israel. God's always getting angry at the children of Israel, and Moses comes in and says, no, 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 please, for my sake, spare them. And God says, okay. Except that even Moses fails as an intercessor uh, at the place where God says, go to the rock and just speak to the rock, and I will bring water out of the rock so that they won't die of thirst. And, of course, Moses loses his temper with the children of Israel, and he strikes the rock. And afterwards, God says, you did not treat me with respect. You didn't listen to me. But it, So Moses is the intercessor, but we're, so, we're shown in the book of Numbers he's not the perfect intercessor. We're going to need a perfect one, which the book of Hebrews says and the book of Romans says is Jesus himself. A second really interesting way in which the book of Numbers points to Jesus is that Jesus is the true Nazarite. There's a fascinating place in the early part of uh, the book of Numbers where it says if you really want to take a vow, make a really great vow to God uh, for a period of time, you can become a Nazarite. And a Nazarite was someone who, A, would not drink wine, B, did not cut hair, and C, never touched a dead body. And during a period of the Nazarite vow, those were the three things you had to do. It was a way of saying, I'm going to dedicate myself to God in a special way. Well, that's interesting. What does that mean? Well, you don't drink wine because God has to be your joy. You don't cut your hair because you're actually saying God controls my life. I don't try to control it. But then you don't touch a dead body because you don't want to become ceremonially impure. But see, Jesus is the true Nazarite. Jesus, of course, took the ultimate oath to come to earth and commit himself to the Lord. But, of course, he left in eternal joy behind in order to come down here. Secondly, he lost all control and became a servant and went to the cross. But here's what's great. Jesus Christ, when he touches a dead body, he doesn't become ceremonially impure. He brings life. He's the ultimate Nazarite. But here's the last thing. Jesus himself points out that in the book of Numbers, there's a place where the children of Israel sin and God sends his wrath against them by giving them a plague of venomous serpents. So there's a plague of serpents that come into the camp of Israel and they bite people and people are dying from the venom. And what is uh, when the people turn to God and say, oh, you know, save us. God says to Moses, put an iron serpent up on the pole and let them just look at it. And when they look at it, they're healed. And it's Jesus himself says, that's me. In the book of John, chapter 3, he says, just as the serpent was lifted up on the pole and all you had to do was look, I will be lifted up. 
and I, I will save you. And you say, that's really interesting. Why? What's fascinating about that is it doesn't take, when, G, when God said, just look at the serpent, what he was really saying is, you'll be saved by faith. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to crawl there. You don't have to do anything. You just have to look. And Jesus is actually saying, see, I save you not by anything you do, but just looking at me in faith. Uh, you may know that Charles Spurgeon, the great um, Baptist minister, tells a story about how he began, got converted. He went to a little uh, chapel, and there was a man that got up there who had very little uh, education. I believe, if I remember correctly, there had been a snowstorm, and the regular minister couldn't get there. So he gets up, and he, he opens to, the, uh, to a verse in uh, Isaiah 45, Look unto me, and be saved all the ends of the earth. And Spurgeon was one of the very few people in the, in the service that day. And this man got up and he said, my dear friends, this is a simple text indeed. It says, look, if you want to be saved, look. It's not lifting your foot or your finger. It's just look. Now, a man need not go to college just to look. You may be a big fool. You can look. A man need not be worth a thousand pounds a year. You can look. Anyone can look. A child can look. And that's what the text says. It says, look unto me. Oh, says this, this preacher, many of you are looking to yourselves. No use looking there. You'll never find comfort in yourselves. And then he turned to Spurgeon and says, young man, you look very miserable. This person sitting out there in the congregation. He turns and says, young man, you look very miserable, and you will always be miserable in life and miserable in death if you do not obey my text. And at that point, Spurgeon says, I suddenly realized I'm saved by grace. I'm not saved by doing this or doing that. And he says, there and then the cloud was gone, Spurgeon says. The darkness was rolled away. And at that moment, I saw the sun. And I could have risen that moment and sung with the most enthusiastic of them of the precious blood of Christ. The serpent in the wilderness. Salvation is by grace. Salvation is by Christ. Just look.